Jim. Thanks very, very much. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here and to, I'm, I'm delighted to see the Institute beginning to really seriously address these issues. Um, I'm sorry I can't speak to you in Hungarian. Um, there's probably about four words in Hungarian I know, something like Ed Pohar Vorespur. I mean, that, that gets me something, I think. <laughs> Later today. <laughs> um, and um, I, I wanted to um, talk with you about the realities that we face. I think um, our civilization, our global civilization, is facing a real problem. Um, and so the, the first thing I was thinking about, actually, I have been, as many, a few people here know, been concerned with the threat of nuclear weapons over the last uh, some years. And the Trinity drop was the first drop of the bomb. Um, it, it was uh, dropped uh, uh, on the 16th of July, 1945. And I was um, still inside my mother at the time. And I think I didn't want to come out. Um, the reason I didn't want to come out was because of the way people were thinking about this baby, including Enrico Fermi, who was one of the key physicists and mathematicians dealing with the bomb. Fermi, on the day of the, um, sorry, what did we do here? Did we turn something off? Um, it goes off here. Oh, just leave it. Yeah. Fermi, on the day of the, the uh, Trinity drop of the bomb, um, was taking bets. Uh, he and Edward Teller, the Hungarian noted Hungarian physicist, was very concerned about this as well. Um, and they were taking bets on whether or not the heat from the bomb would ignite the nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere and turn it into a fireball. So I thought it was better to stay in mum. <laughs> Until, until we knew that it didn't work that way. Um, and as it was, it, it didn't work that way. And um, unfortunately, immediately thereafter, people from um, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki felt the full reality of the bomb. Um, and uh, a couple of hundred thousand died. Um, I have increasingly wondered about the way we think about the world, not only because of my work on nuclear weapons, but more recently on climate change. And I wonder if Einstein, when, after the bomb was released, uh, Einstein said that one of the things that we needed was a new mode of thinking, meaning a new way of thinking. Many people that I knew interpreted that comment by Einstein as meaning new thoughts. I have, for some years, thought that wasn't correct. It wasn't new thoughts that we needed, but new ways of thinking. And I don't mean in some, you know, when, when Chandra was talking about, you know, people buying up, you know, rainforest land, I couldn't help thinking about what they're buying up in Colorado. If you go to Colorado, all you see increasingly are greenhouses and big fields full of a certain kind of plant that people turn into a substitute for cigarettes. <laughs> Marijuana, <laughs> you know, it's everywhere. And it's big business uh, because it's legal in Colorado, but don't take it out of the state that uh, I was, you know, I was warned. So um, th it's this notion of, of uh, decontext, I titled this de the problem of de decontextualized rationality. And part of what I have seen over the years, depending on what field of um, study it is, is too much decontextualized rationality. This guy, Herman Kahn, was st is still considered one of the great nuclear weapons strategists, right? Uh, so Kahn wrote a book uh, some years ago. I mean, he's now no longer with us, probably to our benefit. Um, but, um, but Kahn wrote a book called Thinking About the Unthinkable, right, about nuclear weapons. And part of what some of my colleagues recognized was that he was dealing with matters in a very decontextualized fashion. So, for example, what you had with Kahn was the notion that um, if, for example, there was then an exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union of nuclear weapons, it was okay 
if 50 million Americans died as long as the United States won the war. And I have to say, I found that just a bit strange. Um, and I have to say, re more recently, uh, for those of you who know the, the whistleblower, Daniel Ellsberg, he uh, copied not only the pen famous Pentagon Papers of 7,000 pages that were top secret, but 8,000 pages of the United States' nuclear war plans. It's available in a book called The Doomsday Machine, built around the notion of Herman Kahn as Dr. Strangelove, right? And in that, in his, what he found in the U.S.'s nuclear war plans was that the plan was probably 50 million Europeans, meaning your folks, right? would also die, right? Uh, and I, I, it's just the way of thinking that really, and, and I've spent a lot of time looking at military thinking and I just, it drives me crazy in some ways. So I, I want to uh, read you a couple of things and, and then I'll pass it on, but I'd like to get into a conversation with all of you who are so interested about the way we think about things. And I have a particular, um, a friendly argument with economists around this too, so we'll, we'll do that. There's a section of, of, I don't know if any of you have seen, have seen this book, The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. David Wallace Wells originally wrote this as a piece in New York Magazine about a year and a half ago. And <laughs> it went viral, over a million sends, right? And what Wallace Wells starts, starts the article with is the same way he starts the book. Here's, here's what he says. It is worse, much worse than you think. The slowness of climate change is a fairy tale, perhaps as pernicious as the one that says it isn't happening at all, and comes to us bundled with several others in an anthology of comforting delusions that global warming is an arctic saga unfolding remotely, that it is strictly a matter of sea level and coastlines, not an enveloping crisis sparing no place and leaving no life undeformed, that it is a crisis of the, quote, natural, end quote, world, not the human one, that those two are distinct and that we live today somehow outside or beyond, or at the very least defended against nature, not inescapably within and literally overwhelmed by it that wealth can be a shield against the ravages of warming, that the burning of fossil fuels is the price of continued economic growth. That growth and the technology it produces will allow us to engineer our way out of environmental disaster, that there is any analog to the scale or scope of this threat in the long span of human history, that might give us confidence in staring it down. He then says none of this is true. But let's begin with the speed of change. The Earth has experienced five mass extinctions before the one we are living through now, each so complete a wiping of a fossil record that it functioned as an evolutionary reset. The planet's phylogenetic tree, first uh, expanding, then collapsing at intervals, like a lung. 86% of all species dead 450 million years ago. 70 million years later, 75%. 125 million years later, 96%. 50 million years later, 80%. 135 million years after that, 75%. Unless you are a teenager, sorry, uh, unless you are a teenager, you probably read in your high school tex textbooks that these extinctions were the result of asteroids. In fact, all but the one that killed the dinosaurs involved climate change produced by greenhouse gas. The most notorious was 250 million years ago. It began when carbon dioxide warmed the planet by five degrees Celsius, accelerated when that warming triggered the release of methane, another greenhouse gas, and ended with all but a sliver of life on Earth dead. There's more to this, and uh, I'm sorry it's in the same tone, so I won't uh, overwhelm you. I have to say that the temperature and the climate and the weather is changing rapidly. One of the things I did find when I was in Colorado, I told Ferry this the other day, that part of what I experienced two weeks ago was a beautiful sunny day, 
30 degrees centigrade, and within 12 hours, 15 hours, it had dropped from plus 30 to minus 7 and began snowing. It was unprecedented, right? Unprecedented. And that kind of unprecedented transformation is in our future, right? Um, let me let me um, let me also give you a couple of other things here. Um, will you go one more up for me? Yeah, but put her on the main screen if you can, because it's she's better. She's the most important person. <laughs> this is Ayn Rand. I don't know how many of you have heard of her, but she wrote a number of books and is the guru for lots of. Americans and Brits, British people, sorry, um, the British people who are um, ideologically very much in favor of capitalism. And it's the ideology that is very interesting to me. One of the books that she wrote is called The Art of Selfishness, hmm? right? And that's what she advocates for. As you see here, this is a quote from her, every major horror of history was committed in the name of an altruistic motive. Has any act of selfishness ever equaled the carnage perpetrated by disciples of altruism? Um, I'm not sure, um, you know, I grew up Catholic. I'm not sure Lord Jesus would have liked that statement, uh, right? I think he was opposed to that kind of thing. And I think one of, one of the things that you have to see, if you do a little bit of research, you can do it through any of the search engines, take a look and see who her disciples are. There's a guy that informs a big house in Washington who has liked her, her, uh, her books, you know, Donald Trump, right? But there's others, um, very notable others. Um, in the other book, book that I brought in, called, just called Capitalism, uh, sorry, it has a subtitle, The Unknown Ideal. Um, uh, one of the things that, one of the people that wrote an article in it is a man named um, Alan Greenspan. Who was Alan Greenspan? He was head of the Federal Reserve Bank in Washington, right? The ones that controlled the economy in many, many ways. Um, so, and if you look, the former Speaker of the House from Wisconsin, a guy named um, Paul Ryan, again, his favorite author. Uh, and you see it amongst others as well, members of the Supreme Court and various other officials, right? So the question is to look at, again, the decontextualized reality that you see these kinds of economists and supporters of Rand's vision are using, right? It uh, doesn't make for very happy societies in many ways. And it's going to make it worse when you see the way in which they uh, use that notion of selfishness to just say, forget about those people who are not very active. They're just, you know, like, like some sort of leech on you. You're making the money, and, you know, they should just be thrown off the ship, right? Which is sort of what they've been doing with some of the people in the Mediterranean, as you know. Um, so... Uh, let me just say that this approach of looking at decontextualized realities I think would be very, very useful for us and to say, what is a more contextual approach? Um, there's some of it, but uh, you know, I find it difficult to deal with uh, in uh, Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, which is about our common home, right? And, and uh, it's a much more humanistic perspective than you will find with Ayn Rand and many of the others who support it. Um, I also went on from here to, I, I've been looking at, at military issues and one of, no, you've got to get, that's, no, 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 no one more, no, that's it. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't matter, forget it. Forget it. There, there, just leave it there. That's it. Thanks, Sean. Um, uh, Robert McNamara. I've been studying him and others because of their involvement in a certain war that I was concerned with when I was younger. And McNamara is a classic example of this decontextualized approach to reality. 
I mean, it's, uh, some of it is captured in a book by David Halberstam called The Best and the Brightest, because they were the best and the brightest within a certain context, he and his colleagues. Uh, and they, it wound up with the deaths of a couple of million. Um, so the ultimate question I want to pose to all of you is, is a simple question at one level but a much more difficult one in terms of how we now live, and that is, how should we live? How should we live? That's the real question for all of us, I think. And what it means, it seems to me, what's implied in it is that we need to really think deeply about the kinds of social structures that we inhabit. Uh, thanks very much.